Well, good morning, Grace Church and Valley. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, it is so good to see you. Sometimes in life you just need to take two. That's one of these times right now. <laughs>
that once held me bound. I'm dancing on the chains that are laying on the ground. I'm dancing out of the dark. I'm lighting up the night. Your joy becomes a weapon. And I'm dancing on the grave that once held me bound. I'm dancing on the chains that are laying on the ground. I'm dancing out of the dark. I'm lighting up the night. Your joy becomes a weapon. And I'm dancing on the grave that once held me bound. I'm dancing on the chains laying on the ground. I'm dancing out of the dark. I'm lighting up the night. Your joy becomes a weapon. Dancing on the grave and wants held me down. I'm dancing on the chains that are laying on the ground. I'm dancing on the dark, I'm lighting up the night, and your joy becomes a weapon. Oh, and I'm dancing on the grave that wants held me down. I'm dancing on the chains that are laying on the ground. I'm dancing on the dark, I'm lighting up the night, and your joy becomes a weapon.
Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, your Ha! Ah. 
a song of deliverance from my enemies to Lord. chosen me Yeah. 
I'll share it real quick with you. We were watching an old Kenneth Copeland video a long time ago, and he had an even older video on there. there. Like he's 83 now. And they were having a healing line. They were just walking through. It seemed like nothing is happening. He's just laying hands on people, one after another, just speaking the word. That was it. They were just going on, going on, taking the word. One woman came up and she had a brace. Now, see, we don't see a lot of this anymore because they keep them in homes or places or therapy places. She had a brace here, young woman. She had a brace here. She had braces everywhere. She'd been in a car wreck. And so now her children are having to take care of her. The kids need to hear this. Because I grew up in the, the, the 50s or the healing movement that was going on. And I remember, I remember testimonies of polio being healed. I remember those things. Sometimes we live in an age where they're trying to seed fear over us with over nothing, basically. And we live during times when they put them in an iron lung for the rest of their lives. And they lived in an iron coffin just to get their lungs to breathe. See, our children don't know this, but that's what happened to people when they had polio. Because it would make their lungs not work. So this young woman, she stops and he, he begins to pray. And then he, he kind of embraces her and prays a very strong word over her. And he said, you've got it. You've got it. She walks on. Looks like nothing's happened. She gets to the end of the platform. People start yelling. She starts taking braces off. The power of God was so strong she could hardly, you know, just she's trembling on the platform. She's taking braces off. And she had to climb up the wall because she's been walking with these things. So her, there's no strength in her muscles. So she climbs up the wall with her hands and she begins to, by faith, walk and it's really struggle but they said leave her alone let her have that time reminds me of another one 20 years in a wheelchair down in mobile and i watched that woman i watched it live that night a pastor's wife 20 years from because of a car wreck she had believed god and believed god and it was just that moment god is going to do something in this moment today in somebody's lives i don't know who it is but it's very strong that there is a spirit of healing in this house. Yes, 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 yes. 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 So the story didn't end there, of course. Then she wa she's walking and it's, you know, it's a bit unsteady. He has another part of the film a year or so later. He invites her up. She comes up these steps like that with platforms on and big heels in the back, strong as ever. But the testimony is she was a wife again. She was a mother again. You know, it's other people that hurt as well when the enemy hits one. And that's why we should fight. That's what we're talking about. Much. We should fight it. It's not in the covenant for me. It's not the covenant for you. <laughs> yes. It's getting deep in some of you this morning. Just close your eyes and think about him. How good he has been to you. How good. How many times he's healed and restored you. How many times he's brought you out of hopeless situations. How many times he's been there when nobody else was there. And behold, Jehovah, seated on. Let's 
Let's do that one more time. Remember, 
Amen says, so be it, just as it be. Amen, amen, Let's pray. Father, I pray that those gathered in this sanctuary on this last Sunday in June have done more than just sing the words to this chorus. They've said, Amen. So be it by the truth and veracity, consistency of your life, and the power and truth always from your word. Thank you. May it transform us today. I'll just make us feel good for the period of time here and then go back out into the world, to the job, to the family, to the neighborhood and have fear grip us again, have discouragement grip grip us again, have doubt grip us again. Not giving us a spirit of fear. We've sung about that tonight, today as well too. Thank you. No longer gripped by fear. No longer gripped by fear. No longer gripped by fear in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You can have a seat. Welcome again this morning, Grace Church, and those of you watching my way of live streaming. We're glad to have you, honored that you would be here. I often feel like uh, the late John Osteen of Lakewood, not Joel Osteen, John Osteen, his dad. Dr. Barkley would tell us this. It, he was, uh, John Osteen was one of his fathers in the faith. And he would say, uh, he'd talk, tell, or ask uh, Dodie, right? So his wife's name. Dodie on the way to church when Lakewood was at its peak, like 7,000 something. He said, I wonder, Dodie, if anybody's going to show up to hear me share. <laughs> you think, what's wrong with you, John? But anyway, so I'm always amazed that people show up. Praise the Lord. Listen, give me the lights here a second, if you can. And those watching, again, by way of live streaming, and let's, let's, uh, they'll probably do this on the video again. I'm, I'm so not used to doing this anymore, but let's welcome those who are with us for the first time today. We're glad you're with us. We'll give you, a, we'll give you another introduction here in a second. They probably will do that on the film. How about a little bit of a science class? You ready? Uh, I've been, uh, I'll just put it kindly, bugged an awful lot over the course of the last three months. I told one of our folks on Wednesday night, I've had to repent for some things. I said, God, I'm sorry. Sorry for getting gripped with fear as many of the world have. But anyway, listen to a man preached last night. He makes reference to this uh, article in the Daily Mail, British Victoria, Daily Mail, out of London. (laughs) Now, so I went went to the dailymail.com to find this, to make sure, I had no doubt that this preacher not telling us the truth, but uh, went to the dailymail.com, this was from uh, this week. Now, but their quotes are from, this study was done by Stanford and the University of California at Los Angeles. Everybody say they're really smart at Stanford. It's not the college of what's a motto you. Only older folks would remember that's, <laughs> that's Rocky and Bullwinkle. Natasha and Boris, right? 
Where'd he go? He went to good old What's the Matter You. So it's from Stanford, Stanford. Title of the article is Controversial California Study Claims Americans Are Overestimating the Risk of Getting Coronavirus that the odds of infection are around one in 4,000. Okay, you ready? Who did this study? Not a group of preachers, Stanford and the University of California at Los Angeles. They, uh, these are numbers that they pulled on May the 30th in the 100 most populous U.S. counties. You ready? As he said, and rightfully so, statistics never lie, but liars use statistics. Statistics never lie, but liars use statistics. So now you're hearing spike, 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 cases, 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 right? Not, they're not saying anything about hospitalizations and deaths. It's now cases. So if you've been here, Texas has spiked. 97% of all the ICU beds in Texas are taken. But they stop there. Only 23% of those are coronavirus. Now, this is coming from the administrators of the hospitals. Not Again, this is not coming from preachers. So one admin, they were, they were going to lock down again. G governor Abbott, who's a great governor in the state of Texas, was going to lock down again. The administrators of the hospital said, no, don't do that. Not preachers, the administrators of the hospital said, don't do that. One administrator said, watch this now. He said, this is true. Our ICU beds are at 97%. But on June the 25th of 2019, they were at 97%. We're in a business. It's the hospital business. That's why they're, they talked to Rick and Mary Jane and others affiliated with uh, the hospital. When all that got shut down, no beds, no money. So, <laughs> researchers looked at coronavirus cases, incidence data for the week ending May the 30th in 100 most populous counties. Watch this now. They calculated that someone who has a single contact with an infected person has one in 3,836 chances of getting sick themselves. Who did this study? Stanford. Keep batting that on because you think of all this. This just Roger, he pulled some crazy preacher. <laughs> Calculating the, that someone who has a single contact with an infected person has one in 3,836 chance of getting sick themselves. One in almost 4,000. <laughs> Watch this now. For Americans between the ages of 50 and 64, one of the more vulnerable groups, right? Not the most vulnerable, but one of the, most, one of the more vulnerable groups. Age 50 to 64. You ready? The risk of being hospitalized is 1 in 852,000. Not that you wouldn't get it. It just means if you got it, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be hospitalized. No, no, no major medical attendance that have to be done for you. One in 832,000. Age, what age group again? 50 to 64, not 20 or 30. <laughs> and the risk of dying, oh, come on, is one in 19.1 million. Having gotten it, if you're aged between 50 and 64, the chances of you having to have hospitalization are one in 852,000. The chances of you dying are one in 19.1 million. And we have been scared spitless. <laughs> so I Googled last night after I dialed up this Daily Mail, which the study was done by who? Stanford and the University of California at Los Angeles. So I, I Googled the odds of getting struck by lightning. The odds of being struck by lightning in the United States are one in 700,000. So the odds of you between 50 and 64 having gotten it 
but having to have to be hospitalized is greater than getting struck by lightning or less than being struck by lightning. <laughs> Gosh, I love numbers. I'm a numbers guy. I've said several times over the course of this, I said, listen, the first two or three weeks, forgive my English, but they scared the hell out of all of us, right? World's coming to an end, scared the hell out of all of us. That wasn't true. It wasn't true the disease didn't exist, certainly does. But I, I listened to an epidemiologist, a renowned epidemiologist, virologist from New York early in the process, about mid-March. Never, I never heard another word from him because they were going to, I'm sure, just shut him down because they didn't follow the narrative. He wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal. He was on Fox. He wrote an article, again, renowned epidemiologist and virologist, not just some quack, papered, written guy. And he said, here's what we should have done. He said, we knew early on, we had enough data that we believe was accurate, even coming from the foreign realm, was yes, everybody above 70, and if you had underlying conditions, lock them away. Do that and let everybody else go. He said, the numbers would have gone like this. But he said, in three weeks, we would have killed it, been done. But they didn't do that right so now again the narrative is it, numbers spiking numbers 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 but that article seemed to say they've got you really feared here's what the nation of Austria has done I've ministered twice in Austria they've done away with everything we're done with masks we're done with all of it we're done with all of it done with all of it now listen having having ministered a lot in in england wales scotland twice in austria if you have the europeans laughing at you you're in trouble they're going what is wrong with you guys <laughs> still out there that was our science lesson for today remember st statistics never lie but liars use statistics uh, back in the booth give me this middle camera if you can I don't know where, where you're we have no idea give me the middle camera some of you who are stuck at home God bless your heart fear has gripped you it really has but fear shouldn't grip you listen listen there there were times in this where I, I said I had to repent this week where uh, I got caught up like everybody else believing the numbers and dr. Fauci more than I did the word now, you need to repent when you get to that spot where I'm believing the numbers and Dr. Fauci more than I'm believing God's Word. So, do that. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. And come out of hiding. Chances are one in 4,000 if you even contact with somebody, you're going to get the disease. And if you're 50 to 64, one in 852,000 that you'll ever have to be hospitalized. I think I'll and I would talk about three, three weeks and I said listen this if, if you don't we don't do something we'll never get this time back <laughs> two months of my life I'm never gonna get back so I better be doing trying to be doing something about it so anyway that's your science lesson today and and the hobby horse that had to get off my chest anyway when he said when they would, about three weeks in, they would say, we got to follow the science, we got to follow the science. I went, time out a second, time out a second, time out. You may be right. You may be right. The whole world needs to shut down. You may be right. I think it's proven that was wrong from the get-go. But I would give them the benefit. You may be right, but don't tell me it's science. Don't tell me that. I'm, I'm a, I graduated magna cum may. Everybody knows that. I didn't graduate magna cum laude. I graduated magna cum may, May the 5th, to be exact. But I am smart enough to know there is no science to this, what we've done. You ever realize that? Never in the history of all humanity, never, never, didn't make any difference what the plague, plague was or what the virus was, never until this one did, did well people have to be quarantined. Never, never in history. So don't tell me it's science. You may be right. You may be right. They convinced us early on that was right, but it wasn't science. 
wasn't science because science had never ever 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 done that it only quarantined the sick and infected not the well so for those of you who are still watching haven't turned us off praise the lord <laughs> you're good you're going to uh we uh if you're if you're new to live streaming you, you'll hear the word later on. Don't worry about that. We, uh, we're not doing just do science lessons and political stances. Uh, I said to repent and say, listen, Ned, I'm not going to have the government lock us down again. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Thank God, in, at least in the, in the state of Indiana, we had a fairly... I think he got caught up as, as everybody did. Listen, there were a lot of well-meaning people, well-meaning in the medical profession, and there were well-meaning men and women in government that were just, they, they got the blankety-blank scared out of them just like all of us did. So trying to do they, what they thought was right. I don't, I, don't, I don't lambast them for that. But as I've taught on Wednesday night over this, whole, this last four weeks on the Constitution and the Bible, when you give liberty away, you never get it back. Never get it back. History will tell us that you never get it back. So we've got some power hungry who are inebriated now with power. One writer said years ago, he said, you know a culture and nation is in trouble when small people cast big shadows. When small people cast large shadows, you're in trouble. We had a lot of small men and women with an agenda. And listen, if you don't think this has been, been an agenda in the midst of this, after, again, well-meaning people initially trying to figure out what we need to do about this, to say, we're going to silence you and uh, silence you very quickly. And as I said, Wednesday night, now you have the state of Virginia that has said, if you say certain things from the pulpit, we will fine you to begin with $10,000. If you do not cease and desist, we will close your church down. That's in Virginia. That's not in Iran. Not in Saudi Arabia. That's Virginia. Now, will it get fought? Sure, it'll get fought. But a lot of attorneys and have to fight that because that's flat out against the Constitution. But listen, folks, our Constitution is being run over right now. Being flat run over. So if you give it away, if you give it away, as Franklin said, if you want safety and liberty together, you'll likely lose both of them. So, amen. All right. Where are we at? Announcements. Have we done announcements? Okay. I'm a rookie at this. Go ahead.
Always that hesitation if something else is going to come. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Again, those of you who have been new with us for uh, not necessarily today, if you are new today for, for the first time, but over the course of this month, uh, get upstairs. There's some refreshments. If you need a packet, if you are brand new today, uh, we haven't had the, the uh, fellowship or the hospitality upstairs here since we've gotten back again going. So if you have been with us again over the last few weeks, see the ushers, the care ministry folks are uh, they'll see you get upstairs and, and be blessed. We'll have some fellowship up there and some great food. Praise the Lord. Love to eat around Grace Church. We really do. All right. Why don't you have those uh, students who have graduated from... Uh, we don't have them. Yeah, they don't, we don't have tethers. Sorry, we had a little confusion. We have one more graduate. She's not here yet. But I want you to give a, a, a applause for these girls. They have finished Cultivate. I'm so proud of both of them. They had a lot of trials to come up. And when the first team was graduating, there was a lot of stuff going on trying to stop them. But what I like so much is they didn't quit. They said, oh, I'm not quitting. So during the pandemic and lockdown, we went online and we finished and we studied. And if you don't know what it's about, you need to go to the encounter this fall where we find out about the freedom that was paid for at the cross. And we start walking in that freedom in a new level and cultivate is about that, that new level. Learning things is sometimes it's taken other people 10, 20 years in the church to learn. And we start going through that in the Cultivate. We start encouraging each other. And I'm so excited about these two women of God and what God's going to do in them. He's brought them through many, many battles. <laughs> and they never quit. And that's what's awesome. That's right. We'll get you some certificates to put on your wall. Thank you, girls. That I believe I'm correct is 30 uh, assignments that they go through, a couple leading up to the uh, encounter and then a couple afterwards and then uh, another 20-some lessons that they need to go through. So praise the Lord. We're going to have a testimony here uh, after offering before, before Jim comes to minister from Rick and Mary Jane about the outreach that um, has occurred this week in Aurora and Lawrenceburg. Listen, if uh, you can have marches in the streets all over the nation wanting to pull down monuments and everything else, Christians ought to be able to, first of all, get out from underneath all their fear and get out and be very visible to a lost and dying community. They need to hear the Word of God. They need to hear that. But listen, I mean, if you realize the vast majority of them are not going to enter the church. Not initially. They're going to have to encounter folks who are really walking in the love of God, but in the power of God as well. So, all right, help us ushers. If you need an offering for giving, do that. Again, thank you for uh, what you've done and continue to do over the course of even when we were locked down. Praise the Lord. Let me pray and then uh, come and worship as you give. Father, thank you, Lord, for your wondrous presence in this building today. We're undeserving of that, Father. You, we're not, nothing that we have ever done or will ever do deserves it, but you have passionate people pursuing your presence, Lord, desiring for you to show up because we know if you don't show up, we've just had a religious gathering and little if anything happens. But thank you, Lord, you have shown up, touched lives, will touch lives yet. Thank you for sacrificial giving of some folks, Father, that have shared towards not just the, the, simply the day-to-day -day things, but helping towards the youth in, in, at Invasion next month. Thank you for that, Father, that young people will be, will be radically, radically transformed. They will become, as this next series indicates, nonconformist, extremist, radicals for Jesus Christ. Extremists, nonconformists, radicals, but for the risen Jesus Christ. It's okay to be that when we're for Jesus. Thank you, Father. 
meet every need, every need of families and individuals, that it takes finances to answer, it takes dollars and cents. Meet that for them, Father. And, and those things, Lord, that no amount of money in all the world could fix, fix them anyway as people give in faith. We thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' name, come worship. Jane go to. There they are. Come, Rick and Mary Jane, I want, want you to give a quick testimony about what happened this week and Mark and Maggie coming as well too. Um, those of you on Facebook probably have seen some of this. Those who are not on Facebook or not really up to date on Facebook all the time don't know what all went on this week, but some good news stuff. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, Monday we went to Aurora uh, and decided we were going to pray in the streets. And it was real, real hot, so we kind of drove around and we'd stop and we'd pray. We'd put the word of God and, and call down God and say, this town needs a change. Father, we call you back into the church. We claim this town for the church and for God. And then on Friday night, we went to Lawrenceburg, which we got to pray in front of the police station and pray for the officers down there and that you touch that city. We also went to the casino. And drove up there and prayed against that. In a gentleman's club down in Lawrenceburg, we prayed against that. And some people went to the schools and prayed for the schools and for the teachers and for the students. That, Father, that God would permeate these two cities. Instead of just praying at home for them, we went to the city itself. Well, first of all, it says in Philippians that whatever things are lovely or have a good report, if there be any virtue, any praise, we are to meditate on these things. And we have heard so much negativity here in the last several months that it hit me like a ton of bricks here two weeks ago that back in 7-7 of 07, I had the opportunity, well, we both did, that we was marching in Nashville, Tennessee with virtually thousands of Christians praying in the streets. And God said very clearly to me, why aren't you doing that here? Okay. So, with that began, that happened this week. So I'm going to turn this over to these guys, because they got a story. Yeah, well, my lovely wife got involved with the Aurora Churches Association, and they came to me and asked me if I would make available to them our city hall conference center so that for their monthly meetings. And I did, I quickly jumped on that and said, yes, I welcome you. I invite you into city hall to become more active in what's going on in the city of Aurora. Cause I think the churches should have a lot to, to say about what's going on in my city. So there was need for positive change. And the first time they came in, there was a situation that I was going to be facing the next day. To me, seemed to have no resolution. But the very next day after they had been there and prayed, a resolution was just handed. That there, there wasn't one walking into the room and all of a sudden the situation was resolved in a positive manner. Amen. This very week after Monday night of everybody coming down and praying, within 48 hours I was handed a note 
that the Red Devil pictures were being removed from a lot of the locations in town. We've been up against that for years and just a power of prayer, immediate power. So you got anything to add? Always. Oh, um, that's true. You know, there's some that think that, oh, it's just a harmless mascot. Been around for a long time. But it also represents a stronghold, all right? Who do we want to be a mascot for our, not a mascot, but for lack of a better term, a mascot for our community? Do we want someone or something that is a defeated entity? No, I want someone who wants the best for us, who wants us to right. prosper, who wants us to have a sense of community, who wants us to get along, who wants us in good health, working together as a community of believers. I want Jesus Christ, <laughs> Father God, Holy Spirit in my community. And Amen. It's not always easy because, you know, and know that going in, be of good cheer. You know, there's going to be trouble, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world, okay, right? So with that victory on Wednesday, then you know what hits the fan on Thursday, okay? But you know what? That's okay. You know it's going to happen. Just be aware of it, but we know who has the victory, that's right. I want to thank everybody that helped us and went along with us, too. Do you know yes. who you are? Right. Yes. Uh, you. If you ever want to go again, we'll try to make it visible up on the church screen. If you, those of you that want to join us, your prayers are more than appreciative, and I thank you. Yes. Thank you, Pastor. Yes. Amen. Our next time is Greendale. Uh, we're going to have a determined date this week. Uh, Greendale will be the next one, which is good in, in the fact that we're in Greendale, be praying. How, how many uh, police officers did you guys pray for were, were there? Any idea? Six in the building. Six in the building. They had no hesitation for, understand that? These, these men and women, first of all, right now, don't know what to do. If you're in, you're in I, I ought to be praying for them on a constant basis, but, but certainly... You get an opportunity like they did to go pray and lay hands on them. They're not fearful of that, going, well, you guys are wacky and so on and so forth. They realize full well right now they don't know what to do, how to do it, and they're very, uh, you know, if, if they pass what they, on this, let me get political, political this crime bill that went, that is going to get killed, of course, going from the Congress to the Senate, and it would have to be signed by the President. But in that, every police, if it passed, every police officer could be held liable or anything. Not just choke holes. They stop you and uh, you, they think, well, th that was the car. We, we, we got information it was a car like this and we think it might have been you guys who robbed the bank and it isn't them and they stop you and you say, well, I'm going to sue you for that. How many of you think you want to be a police officer then if you can get sued for everything? <laughs> but they're going to they're gonna have a whole, uh, an holistic group now in Minneapolis. What does that mean? Call the holistic line. Not 911. It will be 911 slash holistic. <laughs> so they're going to send out somebody that is holistic. So they're all going to gather together and I guess burn incense and so we just need to calm down. <laughs> just calm, calm down while, while the guy's got a Glock. Just calm down. Yeah, that, that'll that work well. Anyway, I'm done. I'm, I'm going to quit. <laughs> Come, Jim, and Bail me out of this whole thing. <laughs> well, there are.
there's that. You're really getting your money's worth today. You've had like six or seven sermons already. <laughs> and you still, there's another one, so praise God. Awesome thing you all did. Uh, Rick and Mary Jane had contacted Karen and I about that, and I work, I work evenings sometimes, and that was, but that's what my message is about. So God's flowing this all together, and thank God for our pastors that lead us into these places. Um, they are truly in the vein of what God's doing, and pay no attention to the props. They, uh, I just read a book, we've got it in the bookstore, called uh, Vessels of Fire and Glory by Mario Marilla. It took me less than a week to read. Um, so it's an easy read. I like to read, but, but neither here nor there. I'll, I'll mention, since everybody's taking so much time, I might just take a lot of time today too. We'll see. I will. We'll see. My, <laughs> my precious wife has now she read to our kids we have two children they're not children anymore but anyway she read to our kids all the time she, she loved to read and she was an instructional aide for years so it was always in her veins but she always struggled and I think I can say this she always struggled with comprehension so when she gets into difficult books it's like what did I just read well, I want to give you encouragement if you're dealing with some of that. <clears throat> About two months ago, uh, we got connected with the Rodney Howard Brown, just following uh, what he was. And it was before he, he stood, you know, he did everything right, and yet they still made, and they tried to make an example of him. And, uh, but Karen and I had started tuning in to him before that, and she went online and purchased a couple of his books. Now, these books are 600 pages long, right? If I remember well, it's been a while since I read them. She read the first one a matter of weeks. Now, that was a miracle. And she caught, she got a lot of comprehension out. And everybody's got different reading styles. She likes to read fast, and she certainly doesn't pick it all up. None of us do. So, but I, if you struggle with that, because listen, the word of God is our breakthrough. The word of God is our revelation. And you have to be in it. And you have to let the Holy Spirit help you comprehend it. So if you're stuck there, realize there's a miracle for you. Because there was for my wife. That's just, that's her, to everybody else giving testimonies? That's my wife's testimony this morning. Here we go. Uh, would you stand please? Read the, the core text of the word this morning. It's from Psalm 84, verses 4 through 10 from the Passion Translation. I'll be reading from the Passion Translation, NLT, and New King James this morning. Verses 4 through 10. What pleasure fills those who live every day in your temple, enjoying you as they worship in your presence? How enriched are they who find their strength in the Lord? Within their hearts are the highways of holiness. Even when their paths wind through the dark valley of tears, they dig deep to find a pleasant pool where others find only pain. He gives to them a brook of blessing filled from the rain of an outpouring, and they grow stronger and stronger with every step forward. And the God of all gods will appear before them in Zion. Hear my cry, O God of heaven's armies, God of Jacob. Listen to my loving prayer. God, your wraparound presence is our defense, and your kindness looks upon the faces of your anointed ones. For just one day of intimacy with you is like a thousand days of joy rolled into one. I'd rather stand at the threshold, pay attention to that word, I'd rather stand on the threshold in front of the gate beautiful, ready to go in and worship my God, than to live my life without you in the most beautiful palace of the wicked. Father, anoint my words. It's only with the Holy Spirit that we want to hear anything. Anoint them that it, they would cause hearts to be, realize your truth, and to carry, carry change with that. Carry 
uh, repentance with that. That uh, we would change it, we walk in line with your kingdom, the things that may not be there yet, Father. Anoint ears to hear this morning, in Jesus' name you may be seated. Verse 5 in New King James reads as this. Blessed is, uh, from, from Psalm 84, Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. Say pilgrimage. Uh, we know the word pilgrim from kind of the start of this experiment, the United States. Matter of fact, we're getting ready to celebrate the 400th year of that voyage from Pilgrim, uh, England, to the United States, the upper part of the, and, and, and Victoria's going, why did we ever do it? Why did we? <laughs> but, so that's how we know the word pilgrim. But God says we are on a pilgrimage. So get that picture in your head, because I'm going to be using that a lot. That journey was 66 days. It took 66 days to get from England to the United States to the promised land is what they thought, Victoria. I'm just reminding you. The promised land. They called their, so they didn't call themselves pilgrims. 55 or 53 of them, which was almost half of the crew and the, and the, the people traveling, called themselves saints. I want you to call yourself a saint today. Some of you struggle with that. But if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, that's exactly who you are, is a saint. And you're on a pilgrimage. You are on a pilgrimage. You're moving, you have moved from, and I'll get into that in a second, from one realm to another. And you're, you're trying to bring other people into that realm as they did Monday night when they prayed. Verse 10 in the New King James reads, more like what we know this verse to read. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. So what I'm going to talk about this morning, the title of the message is Gatekeepers and Watchmen. Gatekeepers, doorkeepers. Um, and that you and I are those. That's it's a priestly function. So a little bit of facts here. Gates, thresholds, doors, they're all symbolic entrances into a new world. The pilgrims came from what was called the old world back then into a new world. You're on a pilgrimage. The symbolism between gate and threshold is very similar, similar, but a gate suggests more of a protecting and guarding aspect, while that of a threshold suggests simply a passage from one realm to another. And that's exactly what happened to you and I when we got on our knees or however we did it and asked Jesus Christ into our heart and in our life. We passed, the old man passed away. And we passed into a new realm. Your pilgrimage, okay? You got to keep that word in front of you. Gates are mentioned often in Scripture. David and Samuel appointed 212 gatekeepers for positions of trust and guarding the temple of the Lord. 1 Chronicles 9.22, some of the scripture is not going to be up there. Ezra record, records that 139 gatekeepers made the trip from Babylon to Jerusalem with a Zerubbabel. That's in Ezra 2.42. When Nehemiah had finished the rebuilding of the wall around the city of Jerusalem, gatekeepers were some of the first positions he appointed. You're saying, okay, a lot of facts, figures, why is that important? Well, first of all, a gatekeeper, doorkeeper, it is a priestly function. They pulled from the tribe of Levi. God instructed them to do that. So we know through the book of Revelation and other teachings, God calls us priests and kings. So, you know, you don't have a loophole there. It's a priestly function. Being a gatekeeper, being a doorkeeper is a priestly function. And so it goes on to say, this is some facts I got out of uh, one of the, I can't remember where I got it from. Um, I have the text cited here if you want to come see, but anyway, it's in the back here. Got to keep moving. This significance 
significant because before a city can conduct business, it must be protected from outside invaders. The Lord's house required gatekeepers for the same reason. Before God's business could be conducted properly, only the prescribed priests and other designated servants could be allowed through the gates. So we have that picture here. We have ushers and safety team uh, just for the safety of the house. You know, you don't think of church being a business, but God is a God of order. That's one thing I want you to see in this today is that God is a God of order and we must, in order for the Holy Spirit to have his freedom, there, there must be a protection. And that's where you and I come in, all of us come in, not just ushers and safety team. You know, we're sanctified to be priests. Be, uh, you know, we invite somebody in. You know, we're responsible for them to some extent. Make sure they get in here safely and, and help them through the service. Um, so enough about that. But God's given clear commands about temple business in the Exodus and Hebrews, and gatekeepers were part of that holy business, and their positions were considered sacred. So what I'm talking about today, being a watchman and being a gatekeeper, it's not just a, something you're going to try. It's part of your priestly function, and God considers it sacred. Uh, pastor mentioned in our science lesson before about there was a bill that came before the Senate this week, uh, Senator Tim Scott um, was the author of that bill about the police, the police reform that so many are clamoring for. He mentioned this scripture, Ezekiel 33, verses 3 through 6. When the watchman sees the enemy coming, he sounds the alarm to warn the people. Then if those who hear the alarm refuse to take action, it is their own fault if they die. They heard the alarm, but ignored it. So the responsibility is theirs. If they had listened to the warning, they could have saved their lives. But if the watchman sees the enemy coming and doesn't sound the alarm to warn the people, he is responsible for their captivity. They will die in their sins. Listen to this, folks but I will hold the watchman responsible for their deaths. I can remember the first time I read that. I'm, is that saying what it's really saying? See, the pastor teaches us to get into the story, but you, all, you also got to get into the responsibilities and, and, and almost a legal sense of what God wants from us. It's a responsibility. How do you just pass that off? This is what God, God tells us. We have a responsibility. And, and Senator Tim Scott was talking in reference to that bill. People that don't do something about this, blood's on their hands. And that's what God's saying to you and I. If we don't take up those responsibilities, those things that are in our heart, those duties that we are supposed to be doing, the warnings we're supposed to be giving, opening our mouths, God's saying, I'm going to hold you responsible. That blood's on your hands. Now I bet you wish you didn't come here this morning because you've heard that. You've heard it. Ezekiel 3.17, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. He's speaking to Ezekiel here. But it's a, it's a general reference to God's character and, and that's a word that we should take heed to. Son of man, I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. Let me remind you that he made Ezekiel, he, he poured all this on Ezekiel when Israel was already mostly done. I mean, it was, it was pretty much over. But he told Z, Ezekiel at that point to warn them. So don't think it's over, folks. Don't ever, don't ever, don't ever think this is over, all right? Power of God's so much stronger than anything the devil can throw at us. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. In Aurora, they literally destroyed the works of the devil this week. God did it. But they had a move in what God was telling them, and they had a move. They had a drive there. They had to speak God's words. They had to be the watchman. Three things about watchmen and gatekeepers. 
A watchman shares revelation. Isaiah 62, 1 and 6. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for, for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch on your walls, O Jerusalem. Verse 6. I have set watchmen all the day and all the night. They shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance... Do you put the Lord in remembrance? Is he the first person you talk to in the morning? Is he the one you say goodnight to when you go to sleep? Do you pray to him? Do you call him Lord? Is he your brother? Is he your friend? Is he your savior? Then you put him in remembrance. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest. I'll get back to that in a second. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, pastors talked a lot about this man through the years. Was he a priest, pastor? A Catholic priest? Lutheran, Lutheran priest. That would explain the vein of... I didn't do much research on him on this message. But I have a few facts here about that. Uh, one thing we need to know, he was, he was in the time of uh, when Hitler was coming to power in Germany. He was a Lutheran priest, as pastor said, in Germany, and he had a message. And the message was a revelation that God gave him, and he couldn't not give it. Right. You and I have those kind of revelations in us, and we tamp it down, and we keep it quiet, and we don't live it, and we don't say it. Listen, if you've got your eyes open, it's time to say it. It's time to live it. So he was a, he, on radio addresses and said... Uh, he would speak about this. And, and God works through people to stop evil. He uses people. Imagine that. He uses people. Bonhoeffer said, this is a quote of his, silence in the face of evil, I don't like this, is evil itself. So I imagine you don't like it either. He said, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. God will not hold us guiltless. Listen to this. He says, not to speak is to speak, not to act, is to act. So let's just take Aurora for instance. Whoever it was, Rick, Mary, Jane, whoever got the word, you need to go pray. Then they had, they, they organized, God, they prayed, I guess they, God gave them to invite these people, go pray. So say they would have just went, Psh! I'm tired, it ain't going to work anyway, those people spit in my face, nah. So not to speak, not to act, God says is evil. Now this is, this is, this is his words, but he's pulling it from scripture. And, 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 uh, so anyway, a watchman is so important because a watchman warns or teaches people so that they live, may live and be successful. And, and that's, that's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer is. That's what our priestly duties are, is to open our mouth. Now, you and I all have, some of our messages are going to be the same, but, you know, God places different things in all of our hearts. That's why it's called we are a body coming together, and God uses us. You're responsible for your part, and there's no way you can shirk that. Number two, a watchman spends their calling. A watchman releases the kingdom. I'm going to talk about a story when Jesus was walking with the disciples. And, and he, he, seen a, he seen a man that was blind from birth sitting at the uh, temple. John 9, 1 through 7. Afterward, as Jesus walked down the street, he noticed, say noticed. So he was intentional. He was active. Jesus noticed this man. Just a reminder to you and I as we walk this assignment every day. He noticed a man from a blind, a man blind from birth. Now his 
disciples asked him, Teacher, whose sin caused this guy's blindness, his own or the sin of his parents? Now, I, I didn't do any study on that. It's always aggravated me, though. Why did they ask him that? And one of my thoughts are, on they were looking for, for loopholes. You know, if it was a parent's fault, I can just go ahead and sin anyway, and I won't get, you know, I won't, I won't get sick. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the disciples were thinking, but to me, it was the wrong question. To me, they should have, they've been around Jesus long enough to know, well, we'll pray for this man. He'll get healed. That's the first response we should have. Um, we simply give hope to people and we release the kingdom. We spend our calling on them. Whatever, well, that's why I said there's so many different, different ways that you and I minister. But it's, it's our calling from God and that's how we spend it is on other people. One of the things I think could be involved in that question too is the, the, the disciples were just, they might have been scared to do it or they might have just been... Well, Jesus is going to do it. I'm just going to lay around here. Anybody know what this is? I know it's hard to see from that far away. A pacifier. Now, I haven't used one of these for 59 years probably, so <laughs> I praise the Lord for that. I haven't used one of these for that long. But I have used one of these. And I forgot my phone. So ladies and teenagers, you use a pacifier too. All right. As well as I, our, us men do with phones. Listen, that's what happens. For whatever reason, if that group to Aurora would have just went, no, nah, ain't going to do that. There would have been all kinds, you know. We get in places where we just let the pacifier take over. And people are lost and going to hell and they have pain and they're hurting. And, you know, Jesus noticed this man. He felt his pain. The verse a pastor taught on a few weeks from Psalm 84, uh, the, the valley of Baca, the valley of tears said that they dig deep to find a pleasant pool where others find only pain. Listen, we know where to dig. But those people in pain, this blind man didn't know where to dig. Jesus noticed. You and I have got to notice, folks. We're the gatekeeper that gets people from one realm to the other. So Jesus felt, you, know, you can only assume Jesus had to feel that man's pain. Maybe that's what it takes. Because you and I, I know we struggle with praying for people or sometimes even, even Karen. I'll just suck on this pacifier. That way I won't feel their pain. Jesus answered, the question, neither it happened to him, neither. He said it happened to him so that you could watch him experience God's miracle. While I am with you, it is daytime, and we must do the works of God who sent me while the light shines. For there's coming a dark night when no one will be able to work. As long as I am with you, my life is the light that pierces the world's darkness. Then Jesus spat on the ground one of the neatest things. He spat on the ground, made some clay with the saliva. Then he anointed the blind man's eyes with the clay. And he said to the blind man, Now, go and wash the clay from your eyes in the ritual pool of Siloam. So he went and washed his face, and as he came back, he could see for the first time in his life. Listen, when we get a revelation from God and we move on it and we share with people. When we start spending our calling, which is the gifts and the anointing of God, people will see. They will see. And it might be a healing of, of, from blindness. Or it might just be they've realized who Jesus Christ is. 
because we poured our life. We've spent our calling on them. That's what a man from this church did to me, did for me and the people that have followed me back in 1989. He spent his calling on me, even when I laughed at him at first. Him and I had smoked things that weren't cigarettes for 10 years before that or however many years. I'm like, you're what? You're what, a Christian? Listen, I know Christians. I don't think you're a Christian. But that was my past experience of him. Pastor will often mention, you know, people see him that grew up with him, and he said, oh, you don't know me now. You don't know me now because we're transformed. But then that becomes our responsibility for helping other people see. Number three. This is the last point, but believe me, it's not going to be a short one, okay? Sorry. (laughs) A watchman leads them to the outpouring. So now I'm going to be talking a little bit more about doorkeeping. Psalm 84, 6. Even when their paths wind through the dark valley of tears, they dig deep to find a pleasant pool where others find only pain. He gives to them a brook of blessing filled from the rain of an outpouring. A watchman leads people to the outpouring. Once you've experienced the Holy Spirit, and that's what he's talking about here, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you have a responsibility to get filled up and get poured out for somebody else. And God gives us the power to do that. That's the amazing grace part of it all. He will allow himself to be poured out through us over and over again. If we become vessels that are ready for that. Now think about these these pilgrims again. 66 days. Say day 33. You can't imagine what it was like on that. I mean, they were going to a new world. They... Now, there was travel back and forth before that, but they still very limited. Um, Jamestown was the first settlement like 16 years earlier. I might have my numbers off a little bit. 24 years earlier, I think. Doesn't matter. You get the picture. But it was still a a very new experience, and uh, they had a lot of difficulties, so they left in September. And so they were traveling almost through the winter months. So, in our pilgrimage, if we do this or this, or I forgot my phone, it's like the pilgrims would have just, day 33, they would have went, eh, I think it's a good day to drop anchor. Right in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So, there's a hundred and some people on this boat, 50 some of them saints, I don't know if any of them had passed by then. Some of them died on the journey. And all of a sudden, the saints drop the anchor. And all of a sudden, they're in neutral. They're not going anywhere. They're not going to get to the new world. How many of you know that was the beginning of the outpouring from the old world to the new world? But the saints had to make that journey. Every time we drop that anchor... We're slowing somebody else down. You know, Pastor Tish told you ladies, there's there's still going to be trials. We know that. We know that. He's overcome. Maggie preached that message to us. He's overcome. All the things that Karen and I, we will be married 40 years next year. All the things we've been through. Every time. Every time. Every time. There's always victory. But you can't drop your anchor in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And there are people depending on you and I whether we make it to the new world or not. Now, we, that's a metaphor, you know. But we've made it to the new world. It's now our duty to get people from one realm to the next. 
Last I checked, you have to open your mouth to do that. You have to actually walk somewhere. You have to get rid of that. I'm not going to throw the remote. I mean, I'm not crazy. <laughs> no, that's what we do. That's what we do. Oh, I'll throw it away. That's what we do. You know we do. You've done it. I've done it. I'm not putting down watching TV. Please understand that. I, Quinn, Quinn, I mean, after you preached last week, I'm like, oh, my God, I can't talk about that now. <laughs> we, we use it for rest and relaxation and enjoyment. But it can't be a pacifier. I threw my pacifier away. I can't use that anymore. It can't be a pacifier. Because we have a calling to spend. We have a revelation to give. We have doors to open for people. So now, Karen, you know what the past fire was for, okay? <laughs> I told her to give me a pacifier. Our kids are 35 and 31 or whatever. I mean, yeah, I ain't gonna. She, she said, you know what they want for a pacifier nowadays? <laughs> so... Being today's doorkeepers. Let's try and make this practical. Ephesians 5, 8 through 14. Once your life was full of sin's darkness, but now you have the very light of our Lord shining through you because of your union with him. Your mission is to live as children flooded with his revelation light. And the supernatural fruits of his light will be seen in you goodness, righteousness, and truth. Then you will learn to choose what is beautiful to our Lord. It's a constant learning, folks. It's a constant. What makes him happy? What brings God joy? You know, the key is, that's what brings you joy then, too. Quit searching for joy in all the wrong places. And don't even associate with the servants of darkness because they have no fruit in them. Instead, reveal truth to them. A watchman brings revelation. The very things they do in secret are too vile and filthy to even mention. Whatever the revelation light exposes, you think some things are getting exposed nowadays? It's like a whirlwind. I'm almost sitting with popcorn watching. It's like, wow, look at that Hollywood actor. Hmm. Look at that politician. Hmm. But, you know, not that, please understand, he's judging the church too. So Jim can't get too crazy out there. Jim better make sure he's, I seen this on Facebook the other day and I just loved it. Uh, somebody posted, a, uh, uh, E.V. Hill, Pastor E.V. Hill is with the Lord right now, but he talked about this, this struggle we're having with prejudice that it's just basically, and I'm paraphrasing heavily here, I wish somebody would know a word for a word, but it's just going to, back to the Lord until you can't see the color of a, a, of a person's skin. Right. It, and it may be, take a daily thing for you and I. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I don't know where I was going with that. But, okay, getting back. Whatever the revelation light exposes, it will also correct. And everything that reveals truth is light to the soul. This is why the scripture says, Arise, you sleeper, rise up from the dead, and the anointed one will shine his light into you. It's our responsibility as doorkeepers, gatekeepers, to take people by the hand and take them to that door, and in there is the kingdom, in there is the temple of God, and we have to show that to them. We do it through our light. We do it through the Holy Spirit. You don't make the light some kind of goofy. I mean, New Age has done so many weird things with that, but it's a lot. People can tell your countenance, all right? Yeah. If, you're, if you're moving and flowing in Jesus Christ, most people, unless they're really sinful, they're really glad to be around you, and they don't even know why. Right. Right. 
tell you a story. Last summer, Karen and I were, had the distinct privilege of going to visit our son and daughter-in-law in Boston. And Karen loves lighthouses. So they planned a day trip to Portland, Maine. Some of you have been to Portland, Maine, I know, but just a beautiful little town. And so we got to visit a lighthouse there. It's called the Portland Head uh, Lighthouse. And oh, what a neat experience. Anyway, Karen, one of Karen's dreams to, uh, we were in the museum there and this, this caretaker was in there and I got to talking to him. There was a museum in there. She was looking around the museum and Chuck, he looked a lot like you. He's a neat old guy. He can tell stories like you too, man. I'll tell you, we were having fun talking. By the way, our son's from Purdue, or went to Purdue. So I, Pastor was just telling me about that. Can't wait to talk to you about that. Uh, wow, didn't get many amens from that. <laughs> Woo! Where do you all go to school? <laughs> uh, so, wow, where was I going with that? <laughs> so at the lighthouse, talking with this gentleman, thank you, and I was telling him about how much Karen loved lighthouses. He said, tell her to come over here. Oh, okay. So he just comes over, he said, would you like to run this lighthouse? this afternoon, <laughs> and she was like a little five-year-old. She said, yeah. So, you know, naturally now it's ran with computers and everything. He got, he set everything up for it. Now this, you're gonna program the foghorn in. So she did all that, got everything set up, and then she could hear the foghorn the whole time we were there that day that she had set up and, to run. He gave her a certificate and everything signed that she, you know, she was the lighthouse keeper for that day. I mean, it was, you know, touristy stuff. It was such a dream for her. But there's a picture. Um, that lighthouse is such a picture of who we are. And, uh, wow, can't find that. There was a wreck, a shipwreck, not a car wreck at a lighthouse. That wouldn't happen. That happened in 1886. And it was called the Annie McGuire. It was a ship called the Annie McGuire. And it was, it was on a night where the moon was shining. The, there weren't any storms. It was Christmas Eve of 1886. And the lighthouse keepers were, the wife had butchered eight chickens, and they were going to have a big celebration the next day. And this Annie McGuire, it had 18 people on it crew and, and those traveling, and they crashed into a rock right next to this lighthouse. With the lighthouse on, full moon, no waves, but we, had, we were able to see that rock where it crashed on. It was like 100 feet from the shore where the lighthouse was. So there's, you know, the water was frigid. They were stranded on this rock. And what happened was the, uh, the lighthouse family, they figured out a way to get 100 feet over to them, and they saved all 18 of these people on that ship. What a miracle. Now, that some of them weren't, you and I would say they weren't worth saving because they got into the house, and they warmed them up, and she fed them all their Christmas dinner, and they got, they got drunk and belligerent, and they basically almost rioted, I guess. I guess we'll use a term we know nowadays. But still, they, they showed them a way to get to safe harbor. They showed them how to get from one realm to another. And, and that's your, you and I, we have no business judging who those people are on that ship, who, who, who's in the old world. All we're supposed to do is show them the light. We're supposed to give them revelation. We're supposed to spend our calling on them. And we're supposed to give them an outpouring. They, can, you, can you imagine what it felt like when they were being saved? They're, they're, things come over, you know, people. And, and that, the Holy Spirit on us, we're responsible for that getting poured out on other people. All right? I'm just, that's the point I'm trying to make. I may not be wake, making it real well, but... 
try to finish up here. Acts 3, 6 through 8. Uh, talking about a man who was at the beautiful gate, the gate beautiful, for most of his life. He sat there to be healed. He, daily he would sit there. Um, his life consisted consisted just of sitting outside of that gate. It was one of the entrances where worshipers went to the temple daily. And this is a real thing that happened, folks, because it's recorded in the Holy Bible. But the man spent every day sitting just out of reach of the beautiful gate. Imagine that. He could see the other realm. He could, he could see the people that were going in and out, going in, you know, full of joy probably, coming out full of joy. So he sat there day after day, year after year, receiving, because he, he would ask for alms, he would ask for donations, receiving quick fixes. And he sat and wa watched others who could walk, who with joy and excitement, they'd enter the temple to meet with God and offer prayers and experience God's intervention in their lives. He could look inside, but he couldn't go in. So close and yet so far away. Isn't that the story today, folks? We're walking by people, and not like Jesus. We, Jesus noticed. We're walking by people, and we don't notice. I'm as guilty as anyone. So don't, I'm not, I am trying to offend you, yes, but I'm offended too, okay? <laughs> You say you want to be like Jesus? Okay. Notice. You know, they're near. So many people today are, you know, they're, they're, they know there's something more. I invited several people today that they know there's something more, but they're scared or they're, they just, they don't understand. They don't get close enough to the door to look in to see because they're scared. They're in pain and we won't feel their pain. It's got to change. It's gonna, we can't just mm, pray and, and you and I got to notice and we got to feel people's pain. Not to experience, but, but to love on them. To know that Jesus has an answer to that pain. And you and I are part of the outpouring that God wants to use to fix those things. Right. Amen? Amen. amen? Amen. Since I got an amen, I'll try and close here. Thank you, Pastor and Vicki. So as Peter and John approached the temple this day to go in and pray, this man began, began to pay attention to them and probably asked them for alms, probably asked them for donations as he did every day. He expected to get something from them, but here's what, here was Peter's answer. Verse 6 says, But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you. Because that's not, that's not what you need. He had, Peter had silver and gold, but he, that's not what this man needed. For all those years. See, that's why we have to lead people from one realm. They don't know what they need. They don't know who Jesus is. They don't know how much God loves them. He said, I don't have silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then, walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. They led him from one realm to another by the outpouring of healing, by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You and I can't manufacture that, but we are responsible for walking in it, for, for being, finding that in that dry place of that person, that pain. We know where the pool is. We know where the pool is. Giving water, get life-giving water. One last story. 
say it was our favorite, well, three of four of us, if you pull our family, it was our favorite vacation ever as the kids were growing up. And we were, it was a two-week vacation. There were like three or four different legs of it. We were in Panama City Beach, Florida, getting ready to leave to go to uh, nephew's uh, rehearsal dinner that night. By the way, graduated from Liberty University, Kyle. He's an addictions counselor, just an amazing man. I've got teenagers of his own now. I, I might be getting old. Nah, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. So anyway, we're down in Panama City Beach Friday. We got to get going. And you know, as kids do, they talk you into one more thing. One more thing. You've never done that to your parents, right? Let's just do one more thing. Our kids had never been in a maze before. Like, oh gosh, nowadays, you know, they're all over the place. But, so there was a maze down there, you know, touristy crap. So, okay, we find this. Okay, we'll go. we got time. We got an hour. We got to go get this done. Because we got to drive up to Atlanta yet that day for this rehearsal dinner. So we get there to the maze, and Karen and I are like, oh, we, no, no, we're not going. You two go. They were young teenagers. And so they would buy tickets to get in there. And the neat thing about this one was their observation tower. So we got to go up in the observation tower and laugh at them. And, you know, <laughs> they're not going to get there from there. But it, I got to look at my watch, and, you know, they had, uh, a man does, like, it's going to take me five hours and three minutes to get to Atlanta, so we're going to have to get going soon. I can make it in five hours and two minutes, maybe, but. So finally, I got Karen and I said, you got to go get. I think one of them made it out. And, and, and uh, I won't name which one, but yeah, I had to go look for him. <laughs> the PhD. <laughs> the PhD yeah. So if they're watching. Yeah. So I go looking for him, and, 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 and I asked the attendant, can I go in the, the destination? I, I came from the destination and went back and got him, so I kind of knew the way. Isn't that a picture? God just showed me that's a picture of what life is. Everybody's in a maze. There's a hallway down here that people are in addictions. There's a hallway over here. They're drunk. There's a, and they can't get anywhere because they don't know where to go. There's a hallway over here where people are sick and hurting. There, there's depressed people in this one, go down this one corner, and there, all of a sudden you come to this wall and they're depressed and they can't they don't know where to go and it's your and I's job to lead them out of that maze first of all to care where they're lost and so many and this is get where it gets to spend in their calling you know you can some of you can relate to the those I'm not even going to mention but the, the different kinds of whether pains it is you can relate to that pain and that's one of the reasons God let, allowed it for you to go. He didn't want you to go through that pain. But he's seen the end, just as Jesus was trying to explain to these knuckleheads. That all that don't matter. Just pray for them. Yeah. But God uses that when we go through that, then to lead people out of the maze. Amen. Matthew 7, 13 through 14 says, You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and is and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way, but the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. Thank you for your generosity of time here this morning. I just, I want to, Becky, do we have that queued up? Becky's not back there. Do you have that song queued up? Okay, just, just a second. I, I want you to ponder this. Um, you know, Jesus is the answer to other people's pain. We just have to find those people. We have to lead them out of the maze. And it's just part of, the, it's our priestly duty to, be a, to warn them, but to lead them from one realm to another to be a gatekeeper. A watchman warns, a gatekeeper leads. Um, and I, wa I want you to uh, listen to this song. And I, I, what, what I want you to do is I'm giving you a challenge. I want, if you'll take up this challenge, I want you to go to three people this minimum, three people this week. And, and, and this is a song by Carrie Job and Elevation. It's called The Blessing. And if you get any message out of this, 
It should be that God is for you. And that's, once you get that message, you can let it pour out on other people. And sometimes all you got to do is tell people, God loves you. He's for you. You don't have to go through this. Let me pray for you. Whatever, the, whatever calling you got to spend that day. But I want, I want to put that challenge to you to go to three people this week at least and, and somehow communicate to them that God is for you. And that can be an ultimate different, and, and, and all types of different ways. So let's spend a few minutes listening to this song and just and let God soak us with it. Maybe he'll show you some of the people. Maybe he'll show you the calling you're supposed to spend. Prayer and your calling are currencies that we're supposed to spend. Can you cue that up? Hallelujah. says, and, and just let me tell you this part, uh, you, you remember, you should remember when Pastor taught on this a few weeks ago, it was so powerful. I had got Pastor to ask me to bring a message before that in Ju June sometime, and he said, you probably got something burning on your heart, and I said, no, actually, I don't, so I went before the Lord, and, and he gave me Psalm 84, so, the, like four days before Pastor preached this message, so I just, I text the pastor and I said it's so cool because understand I appreciate so and I get to be in the vein of what God's doing but I appreciate so much that our pastors 
Listen, I, I didn't even get a chance to plug the, the book that's in the bookstore, Vessels of Fire and Glory, much. I read that book this week, and you know what? Part of what caught me so much? Our pastors have been teaching it for three or four months already. They haven't read that book. They're in the vein of what God is doing. So are you. And you're called to pour it out. You and I are called to pour it out. Verse 9 says, God, your wraparound presence is our defense. In your kindness, look upon the faces of your anointed ones. Listen, if all you can do is take that kindness that God looks on you and take it to somebody else and say, tell them God is for them. Would you do that to at least three people this week? Would you do that? Because I guarantee you, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on your face of kindness and just telling them, acknowledging that they have pain and letting them know that God is for them, that's all God needs to start. Can you do that? Will you take that challenge? There may be some in this house don't, that don't know who Jesus Christ is. All they know of him, they know the history a little bit maybe, but they, you don't know him as your personal savior. You've heard enough of who God is, the character of God this morning, to know that he's a good God. And I'd be lax if I wouldn't mention the cross because that's the center of everything of who we are. It's the reason the pilgrims moved through the Atlantic and they did not put down their anchor. They moved forward, and it was difficult. Some of you are going through some difficult times, and whether you know Jesus Christ or not, He is with you. He is for you. But if you don't know Him, I want you to raise your hand, and we will fix that right now. Prayer team, would you come up? Prayer ministry team, would you come up? If God's working on your heart on anything, including not knowing Him, who is this God you're talking about? Maybe your anchor's down. Maybe you've thrown your pacifier too close and you keep picking it up. Maybe you just want to know what's the next step. I know all these things are in me. I know, God, you want it released. You want me to release the kingdom. You want me to spend my calling. You want the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to get on others. If any of that's on your heart, come and get prayer. This is such a great gift for all of us when the I mean, I seen this man pray for healing for a man this week in a small group, and he got healed. Imagine that. The Lord. It ain't him, but his faith is big. And take advantage of the faith of these people that have prepared to release the kingdom, to let the outpouring that's in them get on you and I. Amen? Amen. I love you all. Tell people that Jesus Christ loves them this week. Pastor, you have anything? Come ahead if you need to prayer. Let me, Jim mentioned Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He's one of my uh, favorites. Bonhoeffer was, uh, as he mentioned, a, uh, a Lutheran pastor at the time of the rise of Hitler in the Third Reich. My numbers may be a little bit off, but... There were 7,000 roughly other Lutheran pastors that kept their mouth shut. Only a handful with Bonhoeffer. And we normally like to hear, and, and everybody lived happily ever after, right? That's always how we expect the story to end. Bonhoeffer was ultimately thrown in a concentration camp with the Jews and died by Hitler. But he would not be silent. Here's another thing that, that Bonhoeffer said. If I sit next to a madman as he drives a car into a group of innocent bystanders, I can't, as a Christian, simply wait for the catastrophe, then comfort the wounded and bury the dead. If I sit next to a madman as he drives a car into a group of innocent bystanders, I can't, as a Christian, simply wait for the catastrophe, then comfort the wounded and bury the dead. That's so often what we do. I must try to wrestle the steering wheel out of the hands of the driver. 
So if it's drugs now that are drive, they're driving the cars that were being life, that's the metaphor of life, and they're not only going to take their own self down, but family members with them, do we just wait till they, the crash and they die and their family members are, are still lost and in grieving, or do we try to wrestle the steering wheel out of the hands of them? He also said this, and then I'm done. This is a great one. Your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. Your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief of God. As I often always say, I, I of course use normally Bible folks, Abraham or Habakkuk or whoever that we'll meet one day. But I think one day, maybe after a thousand millennia, at the Costa Coffee Shop, I'll meet Bonhoeffer. And see, I'll, I'll know. He won't know me. <laughs> when I say, well, what sir is your name? He said, I, my name's Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I'll go, can I get my coffee to go? Because I don't want him to ask me what I did. When he stood up to Hitler, the Third Reich, and was almost the only voice among the Lutheran pastors that tried to say this is truth and he's not truth and gave his life for it. I want to be able to say more than I attended church when I could. Amen. Come. If you need prayer this morning, you come. Uh, again, folks who are new with us have been over the last few weeks or the entire summer, get upstairs. Care ministry folks or ushers will see you get up there. If you need prayer, you come. Remember the challenge that Jim gave us. Encounter three people over the course of this week, at least three. Share the love of Jesus Christ with them and hope. Amen. Though I see you Wednesday night. children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going and your weeping and rejoicing